we go forward from, uh, from this point and uh, there will be the next uh, story which will connect the same topic, nature on your mind and uh, we speak about creation of shapes and environments and we have the next speaker here and uh, the Simon Bell which is uh, one of the academics in the landscape and uh, kind of environmental uh, thinking is one of the strongest persons probably in Baltic s states to speak about that but with, with much broader experience from uh, from other countries as well so that will be the next story to reconnect uh, previous lecturers in uh, real locations and what we can do with that please the floor is yours and 20 minutes of great story thank you uh, is this yes okay so thanks very much uh, for the possibilities Lorty Paldius um, and I'm going to build, I think, on what was said so far. Fantastic presentations, really setting the scene for connecting people with nature. And what I want to talk about is, is how we actually work in those environments. My original background, I should mention briefly that I'm British, clearly, from my accent. Um, I was raised, actually, in a national park, the North Yorkshire Moors National Park in the UK, on a farm. So I was brought up in the countryside in a national park with a love of nature, went into forestry, worked for the British Forestry Commission for 20 years on forest landscapes and forest recreation, and then went into academia and accidentally found myself in the Baltics and uh, been in Estonia since 2005 and uh, in fact running a department of landscape architecture where I'm doing a lot of work about health and landscape and outdoor recreation planning and design. So that sets the scene for what I'm going to talk about. Now, let's just put it back in a little bit of context. Some of you, I guess all of you, have heard of John Muir, right? Hands up, who's heard of John Muir? Okay, good, almost everybody. The, the father of the National Parks movement, really. And when I'm in Britain, I live in the town of Dunbar, which is close to Edinburgh, and John Muir was born in Dunbar. And his family went to America and he found his way to Yosemite, had this transcendental experience there, and fought to protect nature. And he wrote this in his Wilderness Discovery books in 1901. Thousands of tired, nerve-shaken, over-civilized people are beginning to find that going to the mountains is going home, that wilderness is a necessity, and that mountain parks and reserves are useful not only as fountains of timber and invigorating rivers, but as fountains of life. Now, we've heard William Byrd talk about the physiological aspects of stress and absence of nature and being away from nature. But back over a hundred years ago, John Muir instinctively knew that this was important. And we use that term stress now, but he would have probably said nerve shaken and over civilized is another word for stress <laughs> or how we would use it now. Now, the thing is that. Um, National, pa national parks that he envisaged were not about nature protection. They were about scenery protection and allowing people to go and experience nature in this kind of idea of the sublime, you know, where you lose yourself in the immensity and the forces of nature. And this is really one of those very powerful uh, feelings, uh, aesthetic experiences that you can get. And so it's not just about nature and wildlife and biodiversity. It's about scenery, aesthetics, experiences, closeness in those different sorts of ways. Now, we've heard a bit about the problems of living in the city and the fact we've only been living there for 150 years or so. And we've heard the physiological issues around this. If we think of the psychological aspects as well. So urban environments are bombarding us with stimulation often negative stimulation, often rather um, um, uh, threatening stimulation. And living and working there requires constant concentration, which is taxing the brain. Natural areas, on the other hand, stimulate us without effort. We do not have to concentrate. Uh, the sounds of nature are calming. The colors of nature help us to relax. And uh, from a, a theoretical, academical point of view or scientific point of view, this is called soft fascination. And it relates to one of the leading theories on psychological theories of 
our um, way that we relate to nature called attention restoration theory by a, a, a pair of psychologists called uh, Rachel and Stephen Kaplan. So we want to bring people to nature. We want to bring nature to people. Uh, we want to get them out off their fat backsides uh, that we've been hearing about, um, up off their bottoms and out into nature. We want to improve their physical, mental and social well-being, as William was talking about. But of course, as you know, as managers and workers in national parks and protected areas, they're sensitive to pressures from too many visitors. So their capacity to cope with visitors has to be respected. And this is really a challenge for planning and management and design. And the design of those facilities that we put in, whether they're trails, benches, picnic sites, barbecues, observing towers, information boards, should emphasize the contrast between urban and nature by not using urbanizing materials, designs, and so on. And of course, we should not overdevelop sites in our rush to make them more and more accessible for more and more people and putting more and more pressure on nature. So if we are very successful in persuading the citizens to go out and to maximize the use of nature, we can end up with quite a pressure and quite a problem that we need to manage. So when we're dealing with planning, as you probably would be aware, we deal with strategic planning, setting high level goals like the national policy for recreation, the, the policies of the Forest Service or the National Park Service or the Nature Protection Agency and so on, all set in the legal and policy frameworks. You then have to manage a place, you have to manage a landscape, a park. You have to transfer those strategic goals into spatially defined plans, maybe zoning plans, where people can do what and where needs to be strictly protected and where can be opened up for use. And then they get applied through operational planning, which many of you probably do from day to day, managing the visitors, picking up the rubbish, cleaning the toilets, repairing the trails, doing something with the vegetation, all of those kinds of stuff, and providing all those facilities, which is where design comes in. So we can talk about this planning circle where we have to balance the visitors, their demands, the activities they want to use, and the impact they have with the natural and cultural environment, its attractiveness, aesthetically speaking, with all the senses, its suitability for different activities, and its sensitivity to lots and lots of feet and wheels and noise. And we can use the recreation infrastructure, the car parking, the trails, the, the visiting facilities, to help people to get access because people might be disabled and older and little kids and, and it maybe needs to be safe, and the landscape to protect it from too many feet, too many wheels and too much noise. So these are the things that we need to work with and understand. Now, if I talk a little about territorial planning, and I know this is uh, not so inspirational maybe, but anyway. Uh, so we need to match the pressure which is coming from different forms of activity uh, to the capabilities of the landscape to accommodate it. And what we can then do is what we call a capacity study to work out how much capacity does this landscape have, this park or parts of the park, this particular area, that particular area and balance the different sensitivities, ecological sensitivity, aesthetic sensitivity, cultural sensitivity, uh, whatever, um, uh, to the different characters. And we can use a tool that we call a landscape character assessment, which some of you from Britain might be a bit familiar with, and some of you may be anyway, where we actually um, divide the landscape up into areas or units or zones of different character. Now, we have this general model of capacity assessment. I don't know if you can really read it, but it probably doesn't matter. But on this side, we have the demand side. We have who are the people? What do they want to do? What are the trends in recreation? And we know that there are rec trends in recreation and tourism, like wellness and uh, glamping and these kinds of things, which, which start to put different pressures on than there might have been some years ago. On the other hand, the supply side, we have the landscape itself and what it's capable of offering for those different activities. Are they water-based activities? Are they winter activities? Uh, what is the geophysical limitations of the area? And then we can look at the capacity for each uh, subunit of the landscape in relation to those different um, 
types of recreation and so on. So we, we can do this. So as an, as, a, as an example of this, I'm going to take a student project from Estonia. Uh, any Estonians in the audience, by the way? Yes, okay. Tervist. Quidus Leheb. Okay, so you know about Otapa. Any one of you from Otapa? No, okay. Oh, yeah, there was a hand up over there. Right. So Otapa is about uh, 40 minutes drive from Tartu in South Estonia. It's the winter capital, although this is a summer view, and that's Lake Puhajarv, or I should say Puhajarv. You don't have to say lake, because Jarv is lake, in the center of the park, which is, by Estonian standards, fairly hilly. Although I'll just mention that Estonia, with Surmunamagi, has the highest landform in the Baltics, a bit higher than Geisinchkalns, which was mentioned uh, about Latvia, just to, you know, just to mention that. Um, it's also where they have lots of skiing activities in the winter, like the big ski marathon, through the Otterpeer landscape. So big pressures on that particular area. This is a, a, a division of the landscape into units of different character, like the hilly, the flat, the lakes, the forests, the agriculture. So hilly, forest, flat agriculture, um, forested river valley, um, uh, chain of lakes and so on. So that's divided up through a process that the landscape architecture students do, looking at layers of the landscape. And then we assess the sensitivity. So what kind of recreation might be affecting it? So ecologically, for example, by disturbance, trampling of vegetation, some vegetation is more sensitive to that than others. E uh, geophysical, like soil erosion, sand dunes are very erodible, um, and peat is very erodible and damaged easily. Um, the aesthetic and sensory, the cultural, like the historical features, maybe manor parks or old uh, archaeological sites and so on. And some might be more uh, important than others, so you might weight them. And then you create uh, a schema for calculating these, maybe numerically, and then create a map showing in darker grey the more sensitive areas and in lighter grey the less sensitive areas. Then we look at the pressure. So what are the kind of activities and what pressures do they put on the landscape? And we take account of what's already there. We try to calculate the demand and the way it's changing. More people coming for winter activities, more people coming for spa activities, more, uh, fewer people maybe doing something else. And what is the target market? Is it Estonians? Is it Baltic? Is it European? Is it Russian? Um, and the pressure according to those. And we can then do um, a pressure map using the same sort of approach with, with the darker the brown, the greater the pressure, and the lighter the orangey brown, the less the pressure, with actually sensitivity and pressure being very concentrated in certain particular places. So capacity then is an interaction between sensitivity and pressure. So if you've got high sensitivity and high pressure, that's going to be quite low potential, isn't it? Low capacity for future development. That's a place you need to protect, you need to maybe um, prevent further development by private entrepreneurs or other people like that. And of course, if you've got low pressure and uh, low sensitivity, well, there might also be quite uh, low uh, capacity because there's no real use for it. And these might vary between winter and summer because we have very defined seasonal variations. And then you can create um, a plan and, and a calculation using the interaction of sensitivity and pressure to create a plan showing where these the, 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 the lowest capacity, the white areas, the one in the middle is Lake Puhejarv uh, that I was mentioning, uh, and then the darker the colors with more capacity. So this way you can start thinking about directing activities or substituting activities. Um, and if there are new developments, well, you move them into those areas away from other areas. Now let's move to design and, and the site level. So the key points here are to reflect the special qualities of that landscape, its character, uh, and to identify what we call its genius loci, or its spirit of place. This term, genius loci, is Latin, as you can tell, and spirit of place is exactly what it means. And it's been used in landscape design since the English landscape parks of the 18th century. And it has some very nice translations. I always like the, uh, the Finnish translation of Paikan Henki, which is really nice. Or the Russian is Duch Niesta. That has a certain... I've never worked it out in, in, in Latvian, actually. Um, so, and we should use appropriate materials and forms of construction to fit that character, to be sustainable, obviously. 
um, but also to, ex to enhance the contrast between the urban and the nature in all aspects of design, because we want people coming to nature to feel they're in nature and not in urban, and to maximize accessibility and safety. So one example is from New Zealand, um, where a landscape architect colleague of mine went to work um, uh, years ago. And uh, this is an example of the use of these local materials and a, and a design which is, n which is basically cutting out the urban. And so this is the car park. You drive down the west coast of, uh, of South Island and you arrive at the entrance off the road. So you're kind of not in a very obviously urban area at that point. You drive in and you've got to park the car. Do you have a car park like a supermarket car park with asphalt and white lines? No. You have an area of gravel with big stones put out by that glacier, and the gravel is from the glacier, created by the glacier. It's laid out there uh, in amongst the native bush, but you can't see the glacier at this point. It's still a bit of a secret. But you feel, right, we're definitely in nature here. We're definitely not in the urban. Okay, you need to go to the loo because you've driven a long way. So that's always an important starting point. So let's make it usable and friendly and not smelly. Uh, and maybe a little building tucked in amongst these tree ferns. Then you've got the entrance to the path with some information, of course, to help people understand, uh, give warning of risks, provide uh, some guidance. And the path goes through the bush and you walk through the bush wondering, wondering where you're going, where are we leading to? And then suddenly, ta-da! You see the whole thing and it's like, wow, this is it. This is the fantastic thing. This is what we've come to see. Oh, hello, butterfly. And um, it wants to go to the glacier, obviously. And uh, so then you've really switched off. All that urban thinking has been kind of put psychologically behind you. You've come into the nature and you've got this fantastic experience. So we, taught, we call this designing the visit. Not actually designing the site, but designing the way that people visit it and supplying the necessary, but only the necessary facilities in the landscape. We're not, we're not at this point, I would say, in nature areas designing the landscape. We can be, of course, but we're putting minimum interventions to maximize the experience of the landscape, the basic requirements, but designed from the perspective of the visitor. So in the Cairngorms, I know there's somebody from Cairngorms here, uh, so this is um, coming into um, the Forest Park, or, uh, run by Scottish Forestry or whatever the hell it's called nowadays. Um, it used to be the Forestry Commission, which was dead simple. Now it's different names in different countries. Um, so Glenmore Forest Park, and you can see easy sign, nice entrance. You can turn in. Okay, there's a pothole in the road that needs to be fixed. But you feel like, yes, we're really in nature. This is a great place. Uh, you'd have to have some information in a very big open landscape like Iceland um, where everything's blown over by these fierce winds and the trees are only this tall, you know. So you have to have some information to help people find their way around in the landscape in a very careful way. You need to park the car. This is actually in, uh, also in, uh, in Scotland, in Glenafric, in the native pine forest, which we're very proud of there, this uh, Caledonian Scots pine. And does it look like a supermarket car park? No, it doesn't. You park in bays, amongst the trees, very in amongst the nature. You can't see the cars from outside. And so you've got this feeling that you really have arrived into the nature. Again, the toilet. This is also from uh, Scotland. Uh, composting, so you're not needing mains drainage. Accessible for people with disabilities, not just wheelchairs, but others. Uh, using local materials, and if, if you can use the wood from that forest uh, as far as possible, of course, that's going to be super sustainable, no transport and uh, everything like that. People will need some picnicking probably, so you probably supply some furniture, and uh, it should be accessible by wheelchairs and people with stiff legs, so that kind of low construction using local timber is ideal for that. And to provide maybe grilling facilities. Maybe you're fishing and you're cooking something you've cooked. This is on a Swedish Lapish uh, river, right next to the, to the river to get all of that exposure to the water. You can fish, you can cook. Uh, you can really get that long-term sort of feeling of contact with nature. And then the access, the boardwalk, the trail into the, uh, 
the landscape. This is actually in Chemedy National Park, so not just down the road from here. Some of you probably will walk that very trail um, tomorrow and uh, have a chance to get into that bog. Uh, there were some um, Japanese visitors, no, Chinese visitors came to one of these bogs, incidentally, and uh, they said, this is a beautiful landscape, but how do you prune all those trees to keep them like this shape? <laughs> you know Chinese gardens, these kind of pruned uh, pine trees. So, uh, okay, yeah. And uh, probably a shelter. And in the winter, it's quite nice to ski and have a, have a shelter with uh, maybe some warming up or in the summer to get away from the mosquitoes. Uh, and spend the time in the landscape like this, again, using local materials, inspired by that. And then also, how we can use other, we've heard about music in the landscape. Well, art, art installations, to have artists working in the forest with materials from the forest. And then it's been the inspiration of land artists and nature artists to work in sculpture and all of these things through, throughout the world. And some fantastic inspirational forms generated from nature, natural forms, bio, biophilia is the word sometimes used about this, and how to uh, work with that. Um, benches don't have to be just benches. They don't have to look like standard picnic tables. They could be much more imaginative and uh, make you want to sit there, make you want to sit, meditate, contemplate, really get in touch with nature, uh, psychologically speaking. Or there are ways of en making you want to go into the landscape, gateways, leading you through the magical gate from the urban and the urban mentality into nature. It's a kind of rite of passage. You know, it's like stepping through the wardrobe into Narnia. It's that kind of thing where you can use this work to do that. So in conclusion, when we're approaching site design for outdoor recreation, think of it from the visitor's perspective. And I know many of you, if you're rangers and things like that, you go and see those sites, you see what the visitor's doing, you never think of it as being a visitor. Go to some other park as a visitor and see how it works is, is very good uh, uh, discipline. We're putting elements, designed elements, into frequently beautiful and natural surroundings. Let the landscape be itself and let us merely facilitate the recreational activities. And those facilities then help us to manage access and to reduce damage to the landscape. There's three useful references here, um, written by me, edited by me, edited by me, uh, together with colleagues, all available at uh, very satisfactory prices uh, from Amazon, um, and uh, I highly recommend them. So thank you very much. Thank you. That was so excellent and uh, probably a great tip for all the presenters, both British presenters, they use the time for good advertising, so the rest uh, <laughs> maybe not so much, but that's, that, that's very well because it's a great content actually. <laughs> right. We have some discussion, the, the end discussion and of course some questions for you, but uh, let's start with, with the same as uh, you already digged into that, about the carrying capacity and kind of uh, possibilities to, to take for certain places the people. Because when we go to the Mr. Bird's uh, ideas of we should reconnect the people and know we have thousands of people who would like to go to the national park and we had that tension here in Latvia with runners, the mm. trail runners. There are more than 2,000 running the same pathway in the national park and they are enjoying, they are reconnected with nature and having this kind of well-being assets, but then uh, where to cut the, the border, where it's too, too big, how to assess that, how to deal with those things where people are very enthusiastic to use the, the, the Yes, well, it's, yeah, it, it's definitely a challenge and it's something that some of the national parks in the US have had to face. And it's also what many cultural historical sites are facing, like if you go to, very famous places like, uh, like the Gaudi architecture in Barcelona. You can't just go there. You have to book a ticket or you have to time ticket. Now, I'm not saying we should do this and, and the, the idea of going to nature for free, I think, is very, very important. So it becomes a question of trying to manage the demand by understanding it and monitoring 
the way that people use it. So constant monitoring. I know the Metsahalitos do that in Finland because some colleagues of mine have, have worked on these systems for monitoring. And where do you get to this point? There's a, there's a method called um, the limits of acceptable change is one tool that's used. We say, what would be the point at which that change is getting negative? And then we have to do something about it. Maybe we have to close an area for a while to restore it. Or we have to develop some different trails in, in less sensitive areas where we can divert where the experience can be good and the running in the forest can be great, but does it have to be in a national, a national park forest or can it be in a managed forest from Latvia Svalsmeji or something, you know, which is a working forest, but it's still a forest, it's still a great environment, but it can withstand that sort of use. That's the kind of balancing uh, thing. Um, and also, we have to remember that, that why you go to nature might vary. It's not the same every day. Oh, today I want to walk the dog. Oh, I want to chill out there. No, I want to go and get some, some good ex exercise. Oh, I want to go with my friends and have a barbecue. So the same place might not be the same experience, and that might change from, from time to, to time. So uh, uh, that's how people vary it. And I know there was a study in, uh, in the Netherlands some years ago when they were planning a forest in the south of the area, the Brackman it's called, and they said, what do people want to do? And they had all sorts of people wanted parties, people wanted to be close to nature, they wanted sport, they wanted to, uh, to, to watch birds, and you couldn't do all of those things all of the time mm. in all of the land, but even the people didn't do those things all of the time, you know, that sort of thing. There, there was already one question uh, about this genius lochi, about the Vietas Gars, we, we call it in Latvian, the okay, Duch right. Nesta. Yeah. Uh, so what about the, the Latvian uh, sea coast? Because the dunes are so vulnerable when you show that showcase about the parking the car in between the trees. It spreads here the, the so massively that uh, all the parking uh, cars, they, they go just farther and farther, and at the end we see just like a big spot of uh, spoiled nature. Yes, how yes. How do we design that, or how do you see, does it work in, in, in certain Yeah, by my book. <laughs> okay. It's all there. The whole Designing car there. parks, <laughs> it's all there. Well, of course, you want, to, you want to work out how many cars to provide for. And ideally, we should build up public transport so you actually don't have to go with cars, but it's not always easy in very remote locations, like the north of Scotland or the sea coast in uh, Kurzeme or somewhere. So that can be an issue. Uh, and then work out how many spaces that you're going to need, maybe with overflow parking on some farmer's field or some place like this, for certain events like these musical events, you'd need a big overflow parking. And then put surfacing down that is local sourced robust surfacing, maybe with a certain amount of geotextile engineering to stop it eroding and, and working away. And then put some sort of barriers, like logs or big stones, around the outside to stop the 4 by 4s and other people going off and driving through the forest and going onto the beach and destroying all of that, you know? So that's, that's a key thing. Okay, but then uh, there was uh, another doped from I like this one, my yeah, phone yeah, number. Who's that? Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, not interested. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> Sorry to keep it going. Uh, when we come to the, let's say, the Baltic scales, and definitely you know from Estonia, but uh, in Eastern Europe, that's, that's a big struggle when we come to the state tenders and when we see all that very inspirational uh, picnic place, it will be uh, more costly. And how to deal with that, that actually we... We have those tenders with the public money that it should be qualitative enough, but cheap enough at the same time. But we would like to have always some kind of, uh, yeah, Well, I would say that, that lots of these things are actually very cost effective. You know, if you've got a forest and you walk in there with a chainsaw and you cut down some trees that have been obviously identified by the foresters and you cut them up and you make your barriers and you just... Um, peel the logs and you construct it there and then. You know, that's, that's very sustainable and it's very, it's very cheap. Um, so I think a lot of this is, is engineers get hold of this. Any engineers here, civil engineers? <laughs> okay, we're safe, right. There is a, ten, a tendency to over-engineer things um, and uh, believe everything should be a big civil, uh, big civil engineering kind of uh, construction. So, um, so that is something to, to, to bear in mind. Um, 
And, and I think what you need is, well, there is an organization, for example, in the UK, Paths for All, and they work on these mountain paths and moorland paths where there have been terrible um, erosion and, and things like this, and then start to, uh, to, to, to build things up using very sensitive local materials, very carefully done. So I think there's an opportunity, actually, for people to understand and learn more about how to do this and, and keep those costs down. Um, but because we were talking minimalism here, you know, less is more kind of thing, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. We got the point. We, we have one uh, expert in the audience who would like to teach us how to uh, pronounce origin of genius Lochi. Do we, do we have that person? Could you tell it loudly that everybody who gets that term is uh, perfect with pronunciation? Just from, from where you are. Genius. Nobody knows how to pronounce Latin. Yeah, that, that's three people like that you, you teach. How, how, how to say it? Latin is a dead language. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows really how it was pronounced in Roman times. But it's at least we try. At least yeah. we try. <laughs> 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 yeah, so uh, there, there's about that. Uh, yeah, we, we try to be more open for everyone. And uh, that, that question about the uh, design, the universal design for everybody, how to deal or how to find a compromise. There are some interesting things about winter. This is a very interesting point because winter, as you know, in, if you're doing forestry, do your forestry work when it's frosty ground and snow, you don't make any impact on the soil with your machinery. Same deal with, with winter activities. So you can do things on landscapes like frozen bogs and lakes in the winter with skiing and snowboarding or even with the snowmobiling and after in the summertime nothing is there but in the rainy autumn or the the rainy summer as we've just had then of course there's there can be lots more damage um, so that that's it. calculating the landscape mm. character doesn't work um, well there are different ways of doing it and uh, it's more an interpretive kind of a work I would say uh, and links to risk assessment yes good point um, Great to encourage people out from cities and towns to enjoy nature. How do you manage their impact? Well, we've been talking about that, yes. Coastal regions, marine protected areas. Well, that's a nice little um, uh, hook uh, I can talk about because um, I'm involved in a big uh, European uh, Horizon 2020. That's the big European research funding project called Blue Health. And it's about blue space, so water landscapes, pre predominantly urban, and health and well-being. So actually... Uh, William Bird is on the advisory committee for that and we're looking at um, how to work in blue spaces and um, how to uh, look at, at this and we have people from Exeter, the uh, European Centre for Oceans and Health uh, involved in there and we are looking at uh, planning and design for access to blue spaces and we're looking at risk assessment, the um, WHO in Bonn are looking at that and we're linking it with climate models and uh, we're linking it with, with health and well-being measures. So um, if you're interested in, in some of that aspect of that, uh, go and look at this project, horizon2020.eu, I think it is the, uh, mm -hmm. the web address for that one. Uh, just hold a second. Do we have somebody from the business presentation still here from uh, Madara Cosmetics or from, from the startup? Yeah, because there was... Uh, if you can come on the stage, because, uh, so, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, that yeah. was an important question uh, discussed during the coffee break about the scale of the businesses, because when we see that the, the business is on a very small scale and it's very nature friendly, but if you can try to answer to part of the audience who was worried about that, when it grows big and when it becomes to be very conventional, how you will deal with uh, the same ingredients and, and matters of nature that uh, every business which is on the big tracks trying to uh, consume more and uh, it becomes a little bit out of that uh, very sustainable way. And, and then we come back just that this is addressed as, as well. Uh, pro probably use that one. I'll just talk. <laughs> okay, so we're still, yeah, actually figuring out how it's gonna be when this business expands, because currently we are very small. And um, but yeah, looking into future, we can see that we should, um, I think, maybe to cooperate with other 
uh, companies and startups who are maybe dealing with the same issue of how how to get these ingredients in a um, greater volume so that we could still keep on growing uh, this kind of business. So the solution I see is just partnerships, I suppose. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be my answer for this question. Yeah, good. Th thanks a lot. We, we still keep it open as there are so many uh, situations where we should really see critically in the, the, the long term. But uh, thanks for your answer. And that was uh, part of the uh, public doped as well uh, after the business presentations. And some of you co commented that this is a very good um, concept of the conference as well, that it's not only uh, nature conference for nature people and business conference for business people so that we are meeting at the edges and discussing about that. But uh, still the, the final thing for, uh, for Professor Simon Bell about what would be your uh, final message to the audience about the daily infrastructure, what, uh, what could be done on, on a daily basis, what is important in maintenance with public in the national parks and protected areas? I think the the fundamental thing is, is, is minimalism, you know, not, not putting in more than you absolutely need, but just enough to satisfy the requirements for accessibility, safety, and coping with numbers, and, and, and that balance between things wearing out and being damaged and, and so on. So constant monitoring of that is needed, and of course constant, uh, constant maintenance. And there are things like willows, as, as somebody pointed out, that just... Uh, rot away, but remembering this is part of nature, isn't it? Te things are temporary, things don't last forever. And if we end up with doing things like the urban, you know, concrete blocks and concrete constructions, and then how do we get rid of them? It's a big problem uh, re removing them. So things that just disappear, start to rot away, they're very easily re replaced, uh, wooden constructions, and then you've always got chance to improve things, to modify things, to change things. And uh, I think we, we, it's flexibility as well, because of changing demands, changing pressures, the changing environment. You know, uh, our plans only last a few years before something changes to, to alter them, whether it's a government policy or a forest fire or uh, an outbreak of a, uh, an insect that kills the trees or, or something of that sort. So, um, yeah, keep it simple. Use those materials which are easily uh, located from the area, reflecting the genius loci, 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 <laughs> genius, loci, pike and Lochi, Lochi. that is the person, loci, right? Eh? <laughs> yeah, um, Latin. Or whatever. It's not Italian though, right? It's Latin. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, <laughs> and, um, and, and always think of it from the point of view of the visitor. Don't just look at it as a bunch of objects that have to be maintained. If something is not being used because the trees have grown over it or it's become all, all covered in moss, you don't need to replace that picnic table, get rid of it. Uh, but think of it from the point of view of a visitor. Go to an area, think, right, I'm a visitor. I'm arriving here, where's the information? Oh, the information is rubbish, actually. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm not uh, Latvian or Russian speaking, how do I understand it? Uh, and it's out of date as well. That telephone number doesn't work anymore. Oh, God, we never thought about that. So these are the kind of things which, if you go at it from a visitor's point of view, you can uncover things in problems and issues that you can then focus on and, and work on and keep the whole thing you know, moving forward. The landscape's not static. The visitor's not static. Why should everything else be static? Perfect. <laughs> Thanks a lot.